So, what if the Benelux was one country? But wait, what is a Benelux? The Benelux refers to a political and economic union between Belgium, the Netherlands and Luxembourg. Luxembourg gets three letters because they're the most powerful of the three countries. The Benelux started with the signing of a customs union between the three nations in the 5th of September 1944, which is quite interesting since they didn't have any shared borders or land in Europe for that matter, being under German occupation and all. The union exists to this day, it has a council, a court of justice and other institutions. It is kinda like a small European Union within the European Union. But what if I told you the Benelux was actually more unified 200 years ago? After Napoleon's first defeat, the Netherlands was liberated and William I of the House Orange Nassau was restored as King of the Netherlands. His country would get boosted in the following Congress of Vienna, which attempted to redraw the borders of Europe, such as to maintain balance of power between the great nations and with that hopefully peace. The United Kingdom of the Netherlands would incorporate the Austrian Netherlands and Luxembourg through a personal union, since the original UK wanted the new UK to be a strong neutral buffer state between France and Prussia, the swamp UK was given back some of its colonies that Britain had borrowed while the Dutch were busy being occupied by Napoleonic France. The British kept the Cape Colony and Dutch holdings in India and gave back the Dutch East Indies and some other colonies to the New Kingdom. When Napoleon decided the second time is the charm and became Emperor of France again, Unsurprisingly, all of Europe declared war on him, and I mean that literally, they didn't declare war on France, but him personally. Napoleon marched into the United Kingdom of the Netherlands and suffered his last decisive defeat in the Battle of Waterloo. This would further justify the New Kingdom's reason for existing at its current size and define its military policy and national character for decades to come. In our timeline, the United Kingdom of the Netherlands existed up until 1830, when Belgium decided to leave the Union, King William I the ruler of the United Kingdom of the Netherlands had a big part to play in the failure of the state. He made Dutch the official language and began modernizing the education and economic systems. Much of his policies were in friction with both the Catholic Church in the south and the Protestants in the north because he was taking power from them and placing it in the central government. And even though he invested into the south, they felt like the Dutch part of the kingdom was prioritized. But what would happen if that wasn't the case? What if the Benelux remained united up until the First World War? How would they change the course of history and turn the tides of the war? If you like watching videos like this, consider subscribing. And now, let's get into it. In our timeline, William I will suffer an unfortunate accident in 1928 and be succeeded by his son, William II enjoyed considerable popularity in the South Catholic part of the country as well as the Protestant North. He was admired for his good manners and his unbiasedness to the North. In our timeline, on the outbreak of the Belgian Revolution, he managed to bring about a settlement based on administrative autonomy for the southern provinces. However, his father rejected the terms of the settlement and proceeded with military action, which radicalized the revolution even more. In this scenario, William II manages to avoid the Belgian rebellion by granting the above-mentioned reforms. He would be a better ruler than his father, and under him, the Union would see great modernization, similar to his rule over the Netherlands in our timeline. In our timeline, when the revolutions of 1848 broke out all over Europe, William decided to institute a more liberal regime, believing it was better to grant reforms instead of having them imposed by revolution. I believe something similar would still happen in this timeline, and the United Kingdom of the Netherlands would be set on the path of liberalism and democracy. William II could also change the name of the country from the United Kingdom of the Netherlands to the United Kingdom of the Netherlands, Belgium and Luxembourg, which could be shortened to the Kingdom of the Benelux, which is how we're gonna refer to this nation from now on. The flag might also change something looking like this. Skipping ahead a couple of decades, the Franco-Prussian War would still happen, which leads to the establishment of the German Empire under Prussian leadership. The Benelux Kingdom, previously more focused on defending against France, who might try to pull another Napoleon, was getting more worried about the brand new German Empire, who was keen on uniting all the German-speaking people into one country. The Benelux would start moving closer to Britain and France, whilst officially maintaining a neutral foreign policy. In the Berlin Conference, the Benelux Kingdom would receive the Congo, which in our timeline was given to Belgium, or more specifically to its king, Leopold II. This was done because most of the great powers participating in the scramble for Africa wanted the Congo for themselves. That's why it was given to a neutral party like King Leopold, but in this alternative scenario, it would not be given to a person, but a neutral country. This would leave Germany bitter by this decision, as they would see the Kingdom of the Benelux as a potential threat. Let's dive in into the German position for a bit. They have just made an enemy for life in France by annexing Alsace-Lorraine, but France is allied to Russia, 
so in the event of war, Germany would have to fight on two fronts, which is not a great place to be in. A solution to that problem is capitulating France quickly and moving the freed up forces to the Russian front. Big problem with that is the border with France had great defensive terrain and was well fortified. Germany's only good option for defeating France quickly is going to the Benelux, which negates France's defensive advantage. To the Germans, war with France was inevitable, so they would start preparing their armed forces and refining their plans for war with the Benelux and France until the time is right to strike. The Benelux, in turn, sensing the German threat, would pour much resources into fortifications on the German border and expanding their military. The Benelux would rely on its colonies' manpower to field many colonial brigades. This would allow them to have a relatively large army size and an even larger reserve force without harming their industrial output. And now, when we have set the scene, let's get into the namesake of this video. Let's see what happens in the First World War. The war will start like in our timeline, with an ultimatum to Serbia by Austria-Hungary. Russia would defend Serbia from the Austrians, the French would back the Russians, and the Germans would honor their alliance with the Austrians and go to war. Not present on the Entente side this time would be Britain. In our timeline, Britain guaranteed Belgium independence because they thought Belgium would basically be a doormat for Germany if they ever tried to invade France. But in this alternative timeline, the Benelux is much stronger, so the UK will not feel the need to defend them. The German plan will have two main points of attack. One towards Rotterdam and The Hague, meant to split the Benelux kingdom in half, and the second towards Paris through Brussels and Mons. The Germans would put their best forces in the second thrust, expecting to have reached Mons by the time the first thrust reaches The Hague. Then the two forces will merge and thrust towards Paris. The area the German first thrust would have to go through is full of rivers and marshes. While that is a disadvantage to regular infantry, the Germans can utilize river gunboats they had built in preparation for the invasion. The reason they're choosing to attack through this unfavorable terrain is because the Benelux High Command won't be expecting Germany to have its main attack through there, so the Germans will have the element of surprise and be able to overrun them. This is a similar concept to the German plan in World War II in our timeline, where they used the Ardennes Forest, which was perceived as impassable by the French High Command, giving German forces the element of surprise and allowing them to overrun the French defense. The Germans would launch the assault on the Benelux Kingdom, which has built fortifications and has massed its army on the border. The Benelux immediately starts mobilizing, but there is no hope for reinforcements to come quickly enough to stop the Germans from pushing. The Germans overwhelm the defense and despite the unfavorable terrain, manage to push through the middle of the Benelux alongside the Rhine and reach Rotterdam. But what's waiting for them is the rapidly mobilizing population of the city alongside some British volunteers. The Germans manage to take half of the city, but the brutal urban combat holds the German advance. This potential battle for Rotterdam would surely look very interesting. In our timeline in World War II, the Dutch actually managed to hold the German juggernaut at Rotterdam and only failed because of Germany's overwhelming air superiority and the threat of devastating bombing to the city. The Battle for Rotterdam also featured the Dutch Navy who brought destroyers to help the defense and prevent the Germans from capturing key bridges. In our alternate battle, there might be a clash between German and Benelux and French naval vessels within the city, but ultimately Germany would not be able to achieve their goal to split the country in two and instead their advance would be stalled by urban fighting similar to what happened in Stalingrad. Meanwhile, the offense towards France has reached the Mose River and stalled. The French have enthusiastically rushed their forces into the Benelux, hoping the war isn't fought on their home soil. The French launched an offensive to take Alsace-Lorraine, but that would have limited success. In the following months, the Germans would push further west towards France and manage to finally take Rotterdam after encircling the city but they would redeploy divisions from the Holland front to the western side of the front towards Belgium because they would begin to fear that the front would stabilize outside of French territory. This means that the Germans are giving up on sieging Amsterdam and continuing further towards Holland and are transitioning their forces there to a defensive footing. The Germans would concentrate their forces on Maastricht, near which they had a bridgehead. The following offensive would be successful, a forced retreat all around the city, but the Germans would once again be stowed when the front lines reached Antwerpen and the outskirts of Brussels. The west part of the Benelux, which was isolated from the capital Amsterdam and under the threat of encirclement, would be put under martial law with the military government residing in Brussels. The decision to place the government there 
would boost morale because it will showcase that the army is done retreating and they're not planning to lose the biggest city within the south. This will mark the first year of the conflict, the front lines are beginning to solidify and both sides are realizing that rapid territorial gains are at their end and from now on the war will evolve into trench warfare. The war would continue to be a meat grinder in the following years, with massive casualties on both sides. The French and Germans would have a more aggressive approach, while the Benelux prefers to retreat to the next trench and not launch devastating counteroffensives. The other fronts of the war would develop similarly to how they did in our timeline. The Bulgarians and Ottomans would join the Central Powers, and the Serbs would be overrun. The Greeks would choose to be neutral, because in our timeline they were persuaded to be in the war mainly by Britain because the Greek king had familial ties with the British royal family. While the war would be going on, Italy would be in constant negotiation with the Central Powers and the Entente, even Britain, but seeing that the Eastern Front is looking like it's gonna collapse for Russia and the Central Powers are gonna come out on top, they would join their side. Austria-Hungary might also entice them by giving some territory away. This would upset the British who now fear that in the case of war with the Central Powers, they would not be able to defend both the British Isles and their Mediterranean holdings against the high seas fleet in the North Sea and the Italian and Austrian navies within the Mediterranean. The British have been preparing for entry in the war and they would declare war after the Italian entry. They launch an invasion in the Dardanelles and in the same time, Greece would join the Entente and launch their own offensive in Thrace. Unlike in our timeline, this time the invasion is a massive success with the Ottoman forces in disarray after the Greek attack, they are unable to mount a defense and Constantinople falls within days of the British landing. The Ottomans would sign a separate peace, with the British and French getting territories in the Middle East. The UK and Greece would form a united front against Bulgaria and manage to push into the east of the country. Bulgaria, peace out too, the country has basically been in constant war since 1912 and the start of the First Balkan War, but even after that, Germany would not be too worried, they would have just signed the brest litovsk Agreement and gained some new land and friends in the East, namely Ukraine, which would trade natural resources with Germany for low prices, which would somewhat offset the effects of the recently implemented British blockade. But the mood in the Central Powers would drastically change when the Entente launches an offensive in the Benelux. The Benelux Kingdom and the United Kingdom had been working on a joint tank and airplane development project while the French chose to design their own tanks. The Benelux Kingdom also had trained a massive army in the East Indies, which it could now fully equip with newly bought British and American weapons. The offensive would aim to encircle the Germans in Rotterdam and push back their gains in France, targeting major cities. They didn't focus on the Italian front, since Italy had barely managed to push in the mountainous terrain, much like they couldn't push Austria-Hungary in our timeline. There would be stiff German resistance, but the superior technology that the Allies possessed would keep forcing the Germans back. The German defenders wouldn't be able to prevent an encirclement, but the Entente, having to reorganize their forces, wouldn't assault the pocket immediately, which gave the Germans time to evacuate a portion of their forces through the sea, while a smaller portion managed to slip through Allied lines, which would minimize German casualties but of course couldn't save their heavy equipment. This would mark the end of the fourth year of fighting, and Germany has lost all of its occupied territories and gotten encircled in the Benelux. Morale would be rapidly decaying. Like in our timeline, there would be two factions within the German government, one advocating on stopping the war and preventing an enemy offensive into Germany itself. The other faction would want to fight until the Entente was exhausted and the public pressured them to end the war, and that would hopefully result in a more favorable peace because the Entente would be in a rush to end hostilities. If you wonder what would happen if Germany decided to keep fighting, you can watch this video, but in this scenario they are gonna accept their defeat and pursue peace with the Allies. The pro-peace faction would win the support of the Kaiser, who is planning on abdicating anyways, the faction would sign an armistice with the Entente and end hostilities, but to their horror, the result of the Versailles Peace Treaty would not be lenient to Germany at all. The treaty would still be less harsh than the one we had, with Germany paying less reparations and getting to keep Danzig, but the pro-peace faction was expecting for no European territories to be lost other than Alsace-Lorraine. This would lead to a coup by the pro-war faction and hostilities would resume, sadly for Germany, some of the army would mutiny 
and there would be a communist uprising in Bavaria and Württemberg, the German Empire would get pushed back by the Benelux, which had their army ready, the Benelux would quickly occupy the Ruhr and the Rhineland, and Germany would fall into disarray. The Versailles Peace Treaty would not be ratified, and for a short period of time, there would be a mad dash in which the Entente powers tried to occupy as much of Germany as possible, so they would have a claim on more territory in the peace treaty to come. The document to end the First World War would be the Treaty of Amsterdam, which would dissolve the German Empire and split it like this. The Kingdom of the Benelux would incorporate the Rhineland area and parts of Lower Saxony. The French would expand their influence by crushing the communist rebellions in southern Germany and establishing a de facto puppet states. The British would occupy the rest of Lower Saxony and Poland would further expand their border. I believe that the tremendous loss of life from this war might radicalize the Benelux Kingdom in the future and its democratic regime might be overthrown. There might be a World War II sparked by the Benelux, but we will have to leave that for another video. If you want to watch another alternate history about World War I, click here, or if you want to see something different, check this video out. See you soon.